Welcome to Ancient Faith Today. This is Father Tom Soroka, and I'm so glad that you're with us this evening. Now, our show is being live streamed on YouTube and Facebook. Just go to Ancient Faith Ministries, and you can watch and join in the conversation during the live show, during this live show in the live comments section. Another great way to connect with us or anytime is to send us a text message at 412-206-5012. And, uh, of course, tonight is our two-hour special. We're going to uh, have yet another, and this is, by the way, going to be a video documentary. Uh, we received your feedback uh, with the first documentary. It was audio only. We went to video. There was a lot of work put into this, but uh, we heard your comments, and we appreciate it. And of course, at the end of the documentary, uh, which today is in six sections, you're going to be able to call in. So we're not going to take calls right now, but we want you to listen to the documentary. We want to get your feedback. We're going to get some quick comments, but you can call us later at 1-855-AF-RADIO. That's 1-855-237-2346. All right, we're on a tight schedule tonight, so the topic for tonight is so important. We're calling it Two Natures, Examining Chalcedon and Communion. And of course, we are talking about the division between the so-called Eastern Orthodox, that's us, the Orthodox that accept uh, the Fourth Ecumenical Council, the Council of Chalcedon, and those uh, who are sometimes called the Oriental Orthodox, that is, those who only accept the first three ecumenical councils. And what we're going to do is, uh, in John Maddox's inimitable way, which we're going to bring him on in a second, uh, he is going to look at it from all different points of view. We have many, many, many outstanding scholars, really, from both sides. And then you are going to come on and you're going to talk with us. So with that, I would like to welcome John Maddox, uh, former CEO of Ancient Faith Ministries, and uh, of course, our documentary host this evening. And we also have Dr. Edith Humphrey, who is no stranger to the show. Dr. Edith Humphrey is a professor Emerita of New Testament from Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. She's an Orthodox Christian, has written many, many books, and so we are very happy to have both of you here. Uh, welcome, John and Dr. Humphrey. Thank you. Great to be back. All right. So we have a lot to do. John, take us through uh, what, how we're going to do this. Today. Yeah, you bet. So as you mentioned, it's in six different sections. The whole thing is an hour, 36 minutes, if you don't include yeah. the commentaries that we're going to do in between. Oh. We have okay. 10 panelists, plus cameo sure appearances excerpted from yeah. lectures yeah. by Father John McGuckin and Father Anthony Paul. So four of our panelists, plus Father Anthony Paul, come from the Oriental Orthodox family. The others are from the Eastern Orthodox or Chalcedonian okay. family. Does it make any so uh, the six volumes? parts are history, why was the Fourth Council rejected by some, is reconciliation even possible, Mona Mia, and you're going to learn what we mean by that, the <laughs> Monophysite and Miaphysite, and what that means. We're going to learn about the dialogues that have taken place in recent decades, by the way, and then the final section will be called Modeling Unity While Praying for Communion. And so, Father and uh, Dr. Humphrey, what we're going to be looking for in particular are the words from a saint that is shared by both the Eastern Orthodox and Oriental Orthodox families, and that is none other than Saint Cyril of Alexandria, and he plays a very key role. Indeed, indeed. And you're going to go through all of those issues. And we, of course, want to reiterate as um, Ancient Faith Ministries, we are a Chalcedonian. And we'll find out what that is for those that uh, are not familiar with this terminology. But we affirm the uh, doctrines uh, and the teachings of the Fourth Ecumenical Council, the Council of Chalcedon or Chalcedon. So, uh, Dr. Humphrey, any uh little uh, thing you want to say before we get started? Just to say that I think that it's wonderful that we're going to do a little bit of focusing on Cyril because he is a saint that is accepted by both the Oriental Orthodox and by us. And so there's a bridge there. And uh, 
if we can see maybe why we interpret in one direction and they interpret in the other and see whether there can be a meeting of the minds at some point. And you have had um, students of the Oriental Orthodox or non-Chalcedonians, correct? Indeed, quite a few. Um, they actually have, have been quite, um, uh, they've really uh, done a lot in, in coming to the uh, Doctor of Ministry program uh, that uh, Pittsburgh Theological Seminary has in conjunction with Antiochian House of Studies, and that's how I first met them, although I was always a friend of, um, of Father Daniel uh, Fanus, who is also a, a New Testament scholar like I am. And since then, I've actually been teaching online for them. I was to go there and then co it happened. So I've been teaching online for them off and on at the St. Cyril Seminary in Australia, in Sydney, Australia. So I count them good friends. Also got to know some of them very personally when I was at the uh, um, International Orthodox Theological um, Association uh, when we were in Greece in Volos. And they are wonderful people. Indeed, indeed. And I think we have to acknowledge before we get started, we're just going to start in 30 seconds here. Uh, I, I think we have to acknowledge that this by far, to me anyway, is the most painful schism. It's the most painful division. And the reason why is we kind of share, um, I don't even know what the word is. I think Dr. David Ford uses the word ethos. Uh, we share a, a sort of an ethos. But I would also say that we kind of share, and this is the term that I heard, we have the same sort of fragrance, you know? We have the same liturgical outlook. We, we of course, our liturgies are different and so forth, but, and our theology is somewhat different, but we, we certainly uh, uh, have a familiarity that we don't have uh, with Protestants at all, uh, maybe just tangentially with uh, Anglicans or, or, or Lutherans, some high church Lutherans. And, uh, you know, I, I must say, uh, you know, decreasingly so with Roman Catholics because things are changing there. So anyway, let's get started. Uh, we are going to ask you again, jump into the chat room at YouTube. We'd love to hear your comments. Uh, be polite, we always want that. And let's get started with the first uh, section called um, history. The history <laughs> of sorry, the history of this division between the Oriental and Eastern Orthodox. Two natures examining Chalcedon and communion. Part 1. History If you're like me, you don't know a whole lot about those ancient Christian churches that are not Roman Catholic, but are still not in communion with us in the Eastern Orthodox Church. These churches were evangelized by the likes of St. Mark, St. Thomas, and St. Thaddeus. We were one church until the 5th century, when the Fourth Ecumenical Council held in Chalcedon articulated theological dogma that some of the ancient churches were unwilling to accept. As in all ecumenical councils, at issue was the identity of Christ. In this presentation, you will hear terms like nature, physis, person, monophysite, miaphysite, Diophysite. Don't worry, we have scholars who will help us sort through these terms, but also introduce us to historical figures like Eutyches, Dioscorus, Severus, Pope Leo, and St. Cyril of Alexandria. As always, the views expressed here do not necessarily reflect the views of ancient faith ministries. Let's get started. What was declared at the 451 Council of Chalcedon? Dr. Sam Noble is a noted Orthodox scholar specializing in Arab Christian studies and Trinitarian theology. He spoke to us from Brussels and gave us a succinct three-and-a-half-minute summary of Chalcedon. Doctrinally speaking, uh, the Council of Chalcedon is part of the whole series of ecumenical councils that are from various perspectives in various ways, uh, attempting to answer the question of, uh, well, who is Jesus Christ? And the important part for the Council of Chalcedon is to explain how Christ uh, in the Incarnation 
is both consubstantial with uh, the Godhead, with the Trinity, and consubstantial with humankind, uh, having taken on our human nature. And so the language that Chalcedon establishes to explain this is to speak of Christ as one person, that is one hypostasis or prosopon, who exists out of and in two natures, a human nature and a divine nature. And these two natures exist in Christ without confusion, change, division, or separation. That is, he is truly God and truly human. His humanity is not compromised. His uh, consubstantiality with us is not compromised. And his uh, consubstantiality with the Trinity is not compromised. He does not become less God, and he does not compromise his humanness in the Incarnation. Uh, and so that's why this language of two natures continuing in Christ uh, in the Incarnation is so important. Now, there are a couple other important things that Chalcedon did that are, so you could think of maybe somewhere in between political and uh, theological. And that is that Chalcedon brought together theological languages and was acceptable in different parts of the Roman world. That is, it, it was not imposing the language of a single power center. Instead, it used language that was acceptable to Rome uh, in the form of uh, accepting the tome issued by Pope Leo. And it was also using language that was acceptable to the Syrians. That is, this language of it, two natures. But in all of this, it was subjecting this varied theological language to a hermeneutic that comes uh, from St. Cyril of Alexandria. And this can be seen in the Acts of the Council, where the Tome of Leo is read, and then there's some discussion and some doubts about it, and it's analyzed on the basis of its conformity with uh, Cyril's theological vision, and at the end they proclaim, you know, this is the faith of Cyril. And so there's a variety of languages uh, that it's possible to use, but it's also canonizing the theological understanding or the theological vision of St. Cyril. So before we explore the historical and theological background, let's identify the players. Who are the Oriental or non-Chalcedonian churches? Christine Chayon has devoted over 40 years of her life to the relationship between the Eastern and Oriental Orthodox churches. We spoke to her from her home in Geneva. Well, today, the name which should be given to the non-Chalcedonians is Oriental Orthodox, and Chalcedonians are also called Eastern Orthodox. Let's begin with the Syriac or Syrian Orthodox Church, known as the Syrian Orthodox Patriarchate of Antioch, branched from the Church of Antioch, a town situated today in the southeast of Turkey, where Christians first received this name. It has apostolic succession through St. Peter, who later went from Antioch to Rome. And the Syrian Orthodox Church has a branch in India. In Egypt, it came from St. Mark the Evangelist, first in Alexandria and then around Egypt. The non calcedonian Church in Egypt is called the Coptic Orthodox Church. In Armenia, according to tradition, the Church originated in the missions of Apostles Bartholomew and Thaddeus of Edessa in the first century. And St. Gregory the Illuminator was the first official primate of this church in the early 4th century. By the way, in the Armenian church there are two Catholicos, 
This is their name. It's the same as patriarchs. And two patriarchs in Echmiadzin, Armenia, Cilicia, we see it at Antelias in Lebanon. There are two Catholics. And then two patriarchs in Jerusalem and Constantinople, which is today Istanbul. And this patriarchate was created at the time of the Ottomans. The first bishop of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church was St. Frumentius, who traveled from Tyre, which is situated today in Lebanon, to the Ethiopian Kingdom of Axum, and who was ordained by St. Athanasius of Alexandria in the first quarter of the 4th century. The Eritrean Orthodox Church was founded in 1998, following the independence of Eritrea in 1993. And finally, in India, Christianity was brought by St. Thomas, and an independent church of the Syrian Orthodox Church tradition was established in 1912, which is called the Malankara Orthodox Syrian Church. So how many of us have actually seen one of the liturgical services of the Oriental churches? Here's just a brief sampling. So how many of us have actually seen one of the liturgical services of the Oriental churches? Here's just a brief sampling. <laughs> Historically, it is always important to understand what was going on politically in any given period to better comprehend the dynamics of communication between rival Christians separated by many miles. And there were some rivalries, most notably the School of Alexandria and the School of Antioch. So there's a whole set of sort of rivalries that are emerging at this time. The oldest rivalry, and theologically the most important, is between Antioch and uh, Alexandria, where there's two separate exegetical tendencies where uh, Alexandria is very, very concerned with emphasizing the unity of Christ, while the Antiochian tradition sees it very important to emphasize the reality of Christ's humanity, simultaneous to the reality of his divinity. And uh, this leads, obviously, to two kind of separate languages that are reconciled in Chalcedon, where the hypostasis uh, ensures the unity of Christ's person, while the two different natures ensures the reality of the humanity and the divinity in Christ. But if Chalcedon reconciled those differences, why did some churches reject its findings? We hear about this tome of Pope Leo, where the two-nature teaching was set against the heresy of Eutyches. 
There are mixed reviews about that letter among Chalcedonian scholars today, but the rejection of the council really had more to do with how one reads St. Cyril of Alexandria, who reposed only six years prior to the council. We learned a lot about St. Cyril from Father Joseph Lucas, who has dedicated years of research on the saint, and in fact has written his doctoral thesis on St. Cyril's teachings. When we read through the Acts of the Fourth Ecumenical Council, St. Cyril theology remained the standard of orthodoxy for everyone present. Nobody was challenging St. Cyril. No one was, was saying, oh, we need to come up with something apart from what St. Cyril uh, had already left them, what he had already taught. They saw it as really an extension of his work. And so, for example, when the famous Tome of St. Leo uh, was presented, this, you know, this uh, Latin tome uh, from the Pope of Rome, it was scrutinized for days. Uh, the bishops had to make sure that it jived with the writings of St. Cyril and, uh, and that the tome pre you know, presented this idea of two natures uh, the, or, or, or a diophysite understanding of Christ. They had to make sure that this was in some way reflecting what St. Cyril himself had taught. And so it was only after some days of examination that they said, okay, we think that it's in line with St. Cyril. And they, even, and they even say that in the Acts, that they came to that conclusion. Um, in the end, the, the formula that was adopted at Chalcedon, the, uh, the, the you know, official, official statement, uh, it doesn't really quote uh, at any length anything from the Tome of St. Leo. It's essentially pulled from from some of St. Cyril's writings. So for example, the, the four famous adjectives uh, that are used to describe the two natures and how they, are, how they interact with one another. Uh, these terms, you've, you've probably heard them before. You have unchangeably, atreptos in Greek, undividedly, which is adiretos in Greek, uh, unconfusingly, uh, asenjitos in Greek, and inseparable, ahoristos. So all these terms, um, that were used, of them, three of them were taken right out of St. Cyril's letter to Sixensis. Uh, they were things that he, that he had written about, uh, and, and they were derived from there. And the final one is, is in line with the others. There's nothing really saying inseparable. It's not really uh, uh, you know, anything but an extension of the other three to make it even clearer. Uh, there's, a famous, uh, the, uh, there's a famous quote later on the letter of Sixensis that makes it clear. This is what St. Cyril actually writes Two sixensis, he says, and so we unite the word of God the Father to the holy flesh endowed with a reasonable soul, in an ineffable way that transcends understanding, without confusion, without change, without alteration. Those were three terms. And we thereby confess one Son in Christ and Lord, the same united God and man, not someone alongside someone else, but one and the same who is and is known to be both things. So this is, this is the main point that St. Cyril was trying to, to put across. And this is, you know, this letter itself is, is uh, a primary source used and approved at the, uh, at the council. Um, you know, and it really does reflect, I think, St. Cyril's uh, desire to make sure that, that what we're talking about here, uh, what is referred to as this hypostatic union, uh, is, is all about single subjectivity the one son of god or word of god is that same one who became man he became flesh and not somebody else not like nestorius thought that uh that they were two alongside one another or two sons that were united through a uh, a union of goodwill which is what uh, nestorius had said at one point that's that's what we're rejecting and that's why Chalcedon uses the words of St. Cyril to try to get that point across. So Eutyches was denounced by both Chalcedonian and non-Chalcedonian families. The Eutychian heresy is that Christ's human nature was swallowed up into his divine nature. But some erroneously claimed that this is what St. Cyril of Alexandria's famous slogan meant when he said, One incarnate nature of God the Word. Do we conclude from that statement that St. Cyril subscribed to the Eutychian heresy? Certainly not, and both traditions say no. But Dr. Noble cautions about putting too much emphasis on just one of St. Cyril's slogans. For the non calcedonian perspective, there's a very, very strong insistence on uh, canonizing a single phrase 
of Cyril, that is, one incarnate nature of God the Word. It, while it's turned into a slogan very early on by uh, opponents of Chalcedon, it's not necessarily programmatic of Cyril's own theology. And, you know, Cyril speaks of, and even non Chalcedonians speak of two usie in Christ, you know, a divinity and a humanity. But it's an, an insistence on a very, very narrow use of his language that uh, they see as loyalty to Cyril. Dr. David Ford teaches history at St. Tikon's Orthodox Theological Seminary, and he agrees with Dr. Noble that we need to avoid an overemphasis on Cyril's statement and consequently ignore the corpus of his work throughout his life. It seems that there is a stubborn, fundamentalistic, literalistic interpretation on the part of the non-Chalcedonians uh, of the words St. Cyril of Alexandria did use sometimes one nature of the Word of God incarnate. And, and of course, our understanding is, and we are convinced Cyril's understanding is, when he says one nature of the Word of God incarnate, he really is indicating one hypostasis, one person of the Word of God. There's the divinity incarnate. There's the humanity. He's really saying one hypothesis with two natures. Dr. Emmanuel Gerges is a Coptic Orthodox scholar and the president and CEO of Agora University. He also teaches at the Antiochian House of Studies. Dr. Gerges appeals to a view of St. Cyril based on what he wrote earlier as it relates to the concept or theory of two natures as opposed to the reality. St. Cyril of Alexandria uses a very key term. Um, well, first of all, if we go back to uh, his uh, 12 anathemas, and I will read from what he wrote, he says, if the union of both is genuine, then there are certainly not two in any way, but one and soul from both is how Christ is understood. And Later on uh, in his book, The Unity of Christ, and uh, the, also the Christological Dialogue on, on the Incarnation, uh, he uses the words the theoria moni, or in thought only. So any mention of two natures after the union can be considered in thought only, so as a, as a theory only, but not in reality, because in reality now uh, the two have become one. And I think just in general, uh, a, good, a good work that also uh, looks at the way St. Cyril uses terminology is a work by uh, Dr. Hans van Loon, who's a Dutch scholar on St. Cyril, called The Diophysite Christology of Cyril. And what he looked at, uh, he examined the philosophical underpinnings of Cyril's writings. You look through to find how he uses terminology. Hans van Loon showed that St. Cyril uses the word thesis not in the sense of like substance in the way that that some other writers use it as a synonym for substance or, or, or something along those lines, but as as referring to a concrete reality. Um, so it's not it's not unique properties of each reality, but this concrete reality of of who we're speaking about here. You know, so it's he's not using it in a um, imprecise way. But he's using it in a very specific way. That's why St. Cyril had to kind of come to terms with the way that uh, the Antiochians were, were using it, because he realized they're using feces, the, the word nature, in a different way than he was. Once he realized what they're doing with it, then he could say, OK, now we're saying the same thing. So we have to actually go back through and examine the philosophical underpinnings of St. Cyril, and certain scholars have already done that. So. So a whole reading of Cyril takes into consideration all of these things, his philosophical background, how he's using terms, um, his commentaries and other early writings that, that do speak about the, uh, you know, the two aspects, you know, the two natures of Jesus Christ, and then also his, his really conciliatory um, documents, these writings after the Council of Ephesus, where he is interacting with other people and trying to come to terms with their usage of terminology so, the terminology so that they agree on these things. And then one name that stands out in the controversy is Severus of Antioch, who is revered as a saint among the Oriental Orthodox, but as a heretic among the Eastern Orthodox in light of his vocal objection to Chalcedon. 
Michael Ibrahim from Sydney, Australia, is finishing his Ph.D. on Severus and told us that Severus attempted to harmonize Cyril's writings about the natures of Christ. So it's interesting in, in, the, in the sense that what he does is he understands the term nature, in fact, as being a, a fairly flexible term. One that could be a, a approached from, from the perspective of, uh, of subject, uh, subject being a person, in which case you see one nature. But he also understands the fact that uh, nature, if understood as a concept, is more akin to uh, essence, in which case we can talk about the natures of Christ as well. But his preference is for the one nature because his entry point is always kind of this relational um, scriptural vision of Christ. You know, when, in the scriptures, when you meet Christ, you don't meet natures, you meet, you meet a person. And so that's why he has this emphasis on on kind of the Cyrillian form, uh, that famous Cyrillian formula of, of uh, one nature of God the Word incarnate. One of the most notable scholars on St. Cyril today is Father John McGuckin, an archpriest of the Orthodox Patriarchate of Romania. He spoke about St. Cyril as a model for reconciliation in August of 2020 at an online conference held by St. Mary's Coptic Orthodox Theological College in Sydney, Australia. Well, let me sum up why St. Cyril can be a model for our latter-day reconciliation. He was determined to protect the true faith of the Orthodox Church. This, it goes without saying, is the priority of all of us as Orthodox, and we must wish to continue. But this brings with it responsibilities. The first of these, I suggest, is that like St. Cyril, we should take a close reading of the great patristic tradition. For him, that meant the lineage of great saints whose writings he had studied very deeply. For us, it means the same. We need to throw away outdated and cheap, apologetically written summaries of who our opponents are, and instead read the writings of the fathers and great saints themselves. There, I suggest, we will find it to be true what the Oriental and Eastern Orthodox representatives said most movingly, most beautifully, at the Aarhus meeting in 1964, and I quote, we recognize in each other the one orthodox faith of the church. Fifteen centuries of alienation have not led us astray from the faith of our fathers. So what was it about the Fourth Ecumenical Council that troubled those churches that rejected it? Stay tuned for part two. Okay, very good. Um, couple of points here. What I heard is this difference between Antioch and Alexandria. Yes, the way that they saw this word physis. Uh, so Dr. Humphrey, give us a little bit of um, your thoughts about this. We, we only have a few minutes to talk. So I, I think the important thing is to realize that, uh, that when you look at Cyril, you can see a kind of a development. At the beginning, he uses the word um, to mean what we would mean by hypostasis or um, prosopon person, but later on, reading um, more broadly philosophically, he starts to understand that it can be it can be used in terms of something that's more philosophical or natural. And I think that 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 we can um, be alienated from each other by different use of terms, and that's an important thing. I do think, though, that there may be something substantial, too, that we will see that causes the rejection and not just a misunderstanding of terms. And that, that probably will become more apparent in the second seg segment that we're going to listen to. Yeah, uh, Father Joseph Lucas seemed to make that very clear that um, once Cyril understood that this was an issue, then he began to use terminology differently. So yeah. I think... You know what the what we will hear is the sort of dogged determination to read Cyril in a very wooden way, uh, which I think can be problematic uh, when we're trying to understand one another. Yes, mm -hmm. I think that's right. John. Uh, outstanding job. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I, I know I'm always struck by the imprecise nature of history. And I actually learned this from you, Dr. Humphrey, uh, in our last documentary about the deaconesses. I think you said um, 
history is messy. And uh, so many factors, right, influence our understanding of history. There's politics, language, communication, distance. And uh, you always have to ask, well, what else was going on back then that might help us better understand uh, where we are today? Exactly. One yeah, thing Anthony like says in the, I'm sorry, I was just gonna say Anthony Fine. says in the chat room, the biggest problem is two lexicons at a time when there was no concrete theological definitions uh, as we utilize today. Good point. That's, that's an issue. All right, one the, let's one go of to, I want to run, yeah, please go I ahead. I want to run with, and we're, we're going to do it again as we get to the end, is this uh, this notice from Father John Bogakin um, that in 19, the 1960s, uh, those who came together from the Oriental Orthodox and from the Chalcedonian Orthodox recognized something of the same spirit of the same faith. And um, we may be divided uh, by nuances of dogma, but there is just something uh, familiar that we will see in each other. And I think that this gives us hope for coming to terms with these complicated things. Indeed. All right, here we go. We are coming up now to part two of our documentary. And part two is entitled, Why Was Chalcedon Rejected? Here we go. Part two. Why was the Fourth Ecumenical Council rejected? Coptic scholar Dr. Emmanuel Gerges says that what was accomplished at Ephesus was negated at Chalcedon. In the Council of Ephesus, and I think we should always start there, because if you think about, about the Council of Ephesus, you're thinking about a council that, that is uh, agreed upon by both families, so our starting point should be there. And um, our understanding has been that what was accomplished at Ephesus was overturned in Chalcedon. So in other words, Chalcedon is the negation of Ephesus. And that is uh, primarily because uh, Ephesus, the, the whole idea in Ephesus was you know, abolishing the very uh, numerically divided natures of Christ as claimed by Nestorius. And so to come back and uh, go against that would uh, then eliminate Ephesus. And of course, the tomb of Leo uh, is, uh, is one of the central points of, re of uh, re rejection in, in, in the Oriental mind. Uh, due to its Christological expression. There are some other elements that I would say contributed to the, you know, the troubling, uh, like you called it, right? Which was that the Council of Chalcedon also rehabilitated uh, certain figures like Ibas of Edessa and Theodoret of Cyrus without necessarily receiving any sort of uh, repentance from their part. So there was no repentance. These two were uh, devotees of Nestorius, and the, the council somehow rehabilitated them without actually them expressing any sort of repentance from their Nestorian beliefs. That's certainly the perspective of uh, Dioscorus's party. And we, we can see maybe uh, what he's getting at by how the Second Council of Ephesus understood uh, what it was doing. The Second Council of Ephesus is very careful not to issue a new uh, doctrinal statement in the way that Chalcedon did, um, or would go on to do, rather, uh, to keep our chronology straight. But in, instead, it simply says that the Council of Nicaea and the Council of Ephesus are sufficient we're talking about Christology. This was, in fact, also the position of uh, Eutyches when he attempted to defend himself, was if he claimed that there should be no further statements of Christology, that his position is the position of Cyril, which is the position simply of the Council of Ephesus. The Reverend Dr. Timothy Thomas is vicar of St. Gregorius Orthodox Church in Raleigh, North Carolina, that's in the Northeast Diocese of the Malankara Orthodox Syrian Church. He is also a visiting faculty at St. John's University in New York and a guest lecturer at the St. Tikhon's Orthodox Theological Seminary in Pennsylvania. The crux of the problem lies in the 
various Christological interpretations and language used to describe the nature of Christ. So if we look at the Chalcedonian definition, it describes Jesus Christ as being in two natures, without confusion, without change, without division, and without separation. Now, this particular definition aimed to combat various heresies by affirming that our Lord Jesus Christ is one person in two distinct natures. We all know that this was an attempt to navigate between the perceived extremes of Nestorianism, which was accused of dividing Christ into two persons, and the monophysite stand, which was accused of blending Christ's nature into one. Now, why exactly was the Chalcedonian definition problematic to not only the Malankara Orthodox Syrian Church and the Oriental Orthodox Church at large? First is the emphasis on two natures. The Malankara Orthodox Church perceives the Chalcedonian formula as implying a division within Christ, potentially the danger of leading to a form of Nestorianism, where Christ's divinity and humanity are so distinctly separate that it undermines the unity of his personhood. And so the Malankara Church emphasizes the unity of Christ's nature post-incarnation as one nature from two natures. And that was also the faith of the early church, because the ek and the en is the difference that was made, because the ek from two natures, Christ is one nature from two natures, rather than saying Christ is one nature in. So that was problematic. The emphasis always had this danger of distinctly separating, and that undermines the unity of our Lord's personhood. For the Armenian Church, there was a geographical border issue where the neighboring Nestorians were actually and falsely claiming victory from the Council of Chalcedon, according to His Grace Bishop Daniel of the Armenian Apostolic Orthodox Church. The Ar Armenian southern border, as I alluded to before, was sort of was Nestorian. There were Nestorians encroaching in Armenian territory and influencing Armenians. Uh, these folks were saying that, you know, uh, Jesus was only seemed to be a human being or he was he was not really a human being at all um, and so forth. Uh, the, so the natures were not absolute were not equivalent uh, and so forth. So w the Council of Chalcedon was accepted by these folks as a vindication of their own teaching. So the way they read the, the, the formulations of the Council of Chalcedon were not the, the Christology that you believe in or that I believe that you believe in but they were interpreted as vindicating the Nestorian cause. That's something which no Armenian could ever accept. Oh. Whether or not that was the, the intent of the fathers of the Council of Chalcedon or not, and I don't by any means believe it was, um, the Armenians at the time could never accept that because we have, again, the documents are there. Uh, the Nestorians were sort of used the council as a rallying cry. And that was just that was unacceptable because that's not an acceptable Christology. The Fourth Ecumenical Council of Chalcedon in 451 was followed 102 years later by the Fifth Council, which many say was a valiant effort to further clarify Chalcedon in a way that would be acceptable to the churches that rejected the Fourth Council. Dr. Peter Butenev teaches ancient and modern theology at St. Vladimir's Theological Seminary and just returned from a sabbatical in Cambridge, where he was researching for a book exploring the division between the Oriental and Eastern Orthodox families. The Fifth Ecumenical Council, it kind of serves as a reader's guide to Chalcedon. <laughs> and it says, this is how we understand Chalcedon. 
and it and it understands Chalcedon thoroughly in a Cyril of Alexandria way, in a way that rules out any whiff of uh, Nestorianism. You know, the, the idea that Chalcedon was a betrayal of Cyril, that Chalcedon was a pro-Nestorian council, well, uh, one could read that definition and say, oh, gee, in two natures, that sounds Nestorian. But if you, if you rule out that reading very, very carefully, as the Eastern Orthodox Church did, uh, then, and especially then, Chalcedon becomes uh, an utterly uh, brilliant piece of, of, of our cherished theology. And so it's a matter of inviting each other to see it in this way and to read it in this way. Um, I think the, the non-Chalcedonians feel that the Chalcedonian definition and the whole council was a kind of a betrayal in that it, uh, it received uh, into communion people whom, who were suspect as Nestorians and who a century later were indeed condemned. Uh, and it uh, welcomed the Tome of Leo, which is a whole complicated text that needs its own proper reading. And it, uh, and it deposed uh, Dioscorus, whom they saw as a hero. So for, for these and other reasons, the whole event left a very sour taste in the mouth. A council was held that, well, basically ruled out any ambiguity of the type that non-Chalcedonians are concerned about. Non-Chalcedonians see two natures uh, as basically meaning two subjects, two sons. They basically see it as Nestorianism. Yeah. And the Fifth Ecumenical Council made it very, very clear that there is a single subject of the Incarnation, uh, that is God the Word, who becomes human while remaining God, this, that a nature in Chalcedonian language is not a substantive thing. It doesn't mean an a, a human. It means humanity, humanness, what's shared by all of us. And this was made unambiguously clear in 553. And so there was, there was always a willingness, even if it became impossible to step back from Chalcedonian language, there was always a willingness to explain what was meant. But obviously, uh, and it, it because, didn't work, right? <laughs> so, uh, no, I, I obviously, it didn't work because from the time of Dioscorus, there was an insistence that only certain language used by Cyril was acceptable. And this was the impetus for rejection of Chalcedon and rejection of any sort of attempts at explain, explaining the theology underlying Chalcedon. Many of the Oriental Orthodox would agree that the Fifth Ecumenical Council accomplished what Dr. Noble says it did. The problem, says popular Coptic speaker and priest of the St. Paul Brotherhood, Father Anthony Paul, is that they weren't invited. Unfortunately, the, the, the Easterners and the Catholics have their Fifth Council, and I say unfortunately because in the Fifth Council, they clarify, quote-unquote, their Christology. And the clarification of the Christology is something that we would be perfectly happy with um, because how they expressed it identifies exactly what the Alexandrians were saying the whole time. And so I say, unfortunately, because we weren't invited, because we were seen as being schismatic. And had we been there, I think we would have easily been able to sign um, because they were saying exactly what we were saying. But a problem arose that they, they, we often suggest that they need to deal with on their end because at that council, they then condemned the same people that they exonerated at their fourth council, um, which we point out as being a glaring problem. Because if you were calling that person not a heretic at the fourth council, which is what we were saying they were, and that the fifth you're saying, actually, yes, they are, you need to revisit the whole thing, um, which is one of like our main points of contention we talk about councils. Coming up in part three, We'll learn about two important terms which may hold the key to advancing the journey toward reconciliation. All right, we're back and we finished the first two sections. This one was a little bit more, um, a little bit more challenging, of course. And it seems like we're constantly hearing about this fear of Nestorianism from the the Far East, the, the Oriental Orthodox. They were very concerned that this language of using two natures 
simply would lead to Nestorianism. Uh, Dr. Humphrey, what do you think? So maybe we can simplify it uh, in a phrase that I, I, I'm borrowing from a good friend of mine, Perry Robinson, who says that from the point of the uh, of, of Chal Chalcedonian uh, Orthodox, we would say that uh, Christ is two with regards to his whatness, but one with regards to his who-ness. So we insist that there is one subject, one Jesus Christ, one God-man undivided. And with that, we're in agreement with the Oriental Orthodox. The problem is that they aren't able to see a distinction between the whatness and the who-ness. And you can see that, for example, in Severus's sermon where he says, you shouldn't be asking what and who. Don't ask what and who. Well, I think we can say there's a difference in what, but there's always the same who. Um, and and I, I, I think the whole the whole language of wills is complicated anyway, um, because we use the word even today in different ways. So when we talk about there being a human will and a divine will, we might be asking ourselves, well, well, I don't have the same will as say Father Tom does, or or, or as as John yeah. Maddox does. We we have different ideas, but that's not using a will in terms of a capacity mm -hmm. or a nature. That's using it in terms of a decision. And so, yeah, so we're, all kinds we're, of we're jumping ahead a little bit. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're jumping ahead a little bit because we haven't gotten to that point yet. Um, John, I want to clarify one thing here because this was a, a shocking statement. Um, and it said, it was one of the Oriental Orthodox, he said, Chalcedon was the abolishment or the undoing of Ephesus. That shook me. I, I mean, is that really how Oriental Orthodox see Chalcedon? No, and I don't think Dr. Gerges does uh, either. Uh, I, I think he would even, would have liked to even clarify that uh, a little bit more, to talk more about spirit than reality uh, in terms of any negation. Uh, I mean, what, uh, again, as you said, it's this fear that oh, you're just going back to Nestorianism. We, we just fixed that in Ephesus, and now you're, you're going back to it. And so, uh, you know, I think what we need to realize that, uh, you know, there is certainly deep divisions uh, between families, and uh, some of those uh, hurts that took place at Chalcedon then got exacerbated in the years that followed. Uh, with some anathemas and with some strong statements, with even some physical violence. And, uh, you know, then by the time the Fifth Council comes around, when you do have a more clarifying uh, explanation of what was being said at the Fourth Council, yeah. then not everybody's there. It's and too late. <laughs> it's yeah. too late. Exactly. Dr. Brutenov uh, did a good job of, of defending the Fifth Council, yeah. And they're, and they're already... Um, pushing back against Nestorians who are saying, hey, look, the definition ex exonerates us. So when they hear that language, it, it, it would be even more hardening them, to them yeah. in, their, in their opinion of what happened at that council. Good point. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a very, very quick break. We don't want you to go anywhere. Stay tuned, we're gonna take a quick break. We're gonna come back with part three. All right, we'll be right back. Perhaps you are a seeker, exploring the abundance of the Orthodox faith. Or maybe you're a young mother, wanting to share the fullness of Orthodoxy with your children and family. Or perhaps you are single, trying to find shelter from unclean images or words. Or an empty nester, wanting to fill your time with edifying thoughts, prayers, discussions, and content. Or maybe you feel alone and just want to find solace and comfort. Regardless of your own unique circumstances, Ancient Faith Radio is here to help with your Orthodox journey. Please consider partnering with us by becoming a monthly recurring donor so that we can continue our mission to spread the Orthodox faith and help support the spiritual lives of the already faithful. Any consistent donation, large or small, will enable us to focus on our mission unabated. Simply visit www.ancientfaith.com support and start your monthly donations today. All gifts are tax deductible and greatly appreciated. Thank you.
Welcome back. We are now in our part three of the uh, documentary that John Maddox put together. Outstanding speakers. We're talking about the uh, divisions between Orthodox and Oriental, uh, Eastern Orthodox and Oriental Orthodox. Our third section is called Mona Mia. And you'll see what that means in a second. Here we go. Part three, Mona Mia. The charge laid against those who rejected the Chalcedonian Council was that they sided with Eutyches and were essentially Monophysites. Coptic scholar Dr. Emmanuel Gerges explains that term, as well as the term the Oriental Orthodox agree on, Miophysite. Monophysitism, like Monophysite's uh, um, uh, Christology, refers to the Christological perspective that was held by Eutyches. Um, and that is completely rejected by the Coptic Church, by the Oriental Churches as well. So, uh, monophysitism, which is uh, condemned by uh, the, the Church at large, uh, is not the belief of the Coptic Church or any of the Oriental Churches. Now, miaphysitism uh, is a term that reflects the usage of St. Cyril of Alexandria's uh, most famous phrase, mea fusis to theologos sarcomeni, or the one nature of the incarnate logos uh, made flesh, right? So um, th that's a different definition than uh, monophysitism. So mea simply means one, whereas mono uh, simply means soul uh, or, or only, right? So, so these are completely different uh, words. So we believe in uh, the, the one nature of the incarnate logos, and um, that is different than monophysitism. Monophysite uh, for centuries was kind of the going term to describe a very broad swath of those who taught that Christ had one nature. Uh, the problem with the term monophysite is that it could describe um, heretics like Eutyches, uh, you might call it Eutychian monophysitism, or you could call it radical monophysitism, uh, who basically taught that Christ had no humanity at all, no human nature at all. Uh, but then uh, monophysites used to also describe what you might call moderate monophysites, Severian monophysites, etc., who taught that Christ was absolutely one with God and one with us. He has full humanity. Um, this is why he can say things like, I thirst, I hunger, um, ask where Lazarus is laid, etc. Miaphysite now comes into play as, as a much more accurate term to describe the non-heretical monophysites. Why Miaphysite? Well, because it follows St. Cyril of Alexandria's formula. St. Cyril was a Miaphysite. <laughs> he taught Miaphysis to Theologus Sarcomeni, one nature of God, the Word incarnate, that one nature is a divino-human nature. It is both divine and human, right? So it's it's a way of maintaining the integrity and, and uh, singularity of Christ's person. He is one person uh, who is both divine and human. That's his nature, to be both God and man. The mere thesis doctrine, therefore, is one that states the incarnate Lord Jesus is one concrete reality placed before our eyes, and that he does all things in and from the same self-same singularity of his divine person as one of the Trinity. He definitely does not suffer as a man on the cross and rise from the dead as God. He suffers on the cross as the word incarnate and made man, and he rises from the dead as the word incarnate. That's it. When many other theologians outside of Egypt cried for greater articulation, Cyril insisted that the mystery was to be appreciated elsewhere than in syllogism. And so he annoyed everybody, but especially in the stories, by resorting to his famous dense spiritual paradoxes. The Otokos, the Mother of God, 
apathos apathen eh, who suffered in Cassidy, and many others whose crashing juxtaposition, in effect, created a set of Christian aporias that demanded the attentive listener should make the mind leap that the apparent error was resolved in the doctrine of Johannosis. The doctrine is so simple that since Cyril himself often had difficulty understanding how so many others, especially in 5th century Rome and Syria, could be worried by it. The wonderment of the idea, however, is Bhavma, is that the Divine Lord should have become so much one with his own flesh in the Incarnation that this instant of human flesh, and through it, humanity itself, was elevated into something it was not before the Incarnation. Before the Incarnation, humanity was old as an enslaved to corruptibility, Valsia. After the Incarnation, humanity was given the potentiality to become new Adam in Christ, who was the new Adam. This unit of power of entering into the new humanity of the Lord was, as St. Cyril so often pointed out, contained in the Church's mystical and sacramental life, energized there by the Holy Spirit. Many commentators on St. Cyril fail to get this simplicity of vision. It is partly because so many of them, commenting on Church history, nowadays are not themselves embedded in the Church tradition, but everywhere else enshrines and embodies this mystically sacramental view of the Christian philosophy. It is an approach to incarnational theology, however, that is still shared as a common heritage and lived experience throughout the Orthodox Church. It is one of the signs, of course, that we are Orthodox, a character or defining mark of the Church that is fundamental, and I would say is the great ground of hope for our eventual reconciliation. See, for the Eastern Orthodox tradition, its confession of Christological faith is actually a synthesis of the teachings of Ephesus in 431, Chalcedon in 451, and Constantinople in 553. These three councils can never be separated in the confession of the Eastern Orthodox, since all are regarded as the authentic exegesis of the others. And so here, interestingly, the Miaphysite doctrine of St. Cyril is as correct as the Diophysite doctrine of Chalcedon. See, the term thesis is used by St. Cyril in an archaic sense as an equivalent to the term hypostasis at Chalcedon later. And so the mere thesis can coexist as an important and common element of universal Christian orthodoxy, along with the deo fece, without being logically contradictory. So we've heard these three terms, monophysite. This is a heresy. It denies that Christ is fully human and fully divine. We associate this with Eutyches, who was condemned as a heretic. Then there is miophysite. This comes from St. Cyril of Alexandria and his phrase, One Incarnate Nature of God the Word, which Father Timothy says is completely compatible with the next term, diophysite, which was confirmed at the Fourth Council of Chalcedon. After the schism at Chalcedon, every conceivable obstacle came along to drive the factions even further apart. The actual theology was superseded by politics and some bad actors. We got a glimpse of these historical realities from noted Orthodox historian Dr. David Ford. He minces no words in describing at least one key factor that made it virtually impossible to reconcile. 
uh, I'm calling this stubborn, fundamentalistic, literalistic interpretation of the doctrinal decree of the Council of Chalcedon on the part of the Church of Rome. Now, uh, Rome feels uh, very committed to the exact wording of Chalcedon. I think one big reason, huge reason, is that their bishop at the time, St. Leo of Rome, uh, his tome, his famous tome, was read at the Council of Chalcedon. So they're committed to the exact language of uh, the, the Tome of Leo and the definition of Chalcedon, which incorporates some of the language from the Tome, uh, not all of it. And we see this refusal to go beyond the uh, exact letter of Chalcedon in the year 520, when Pope Hormizdas, he's approached by some of the non-Chalcedonians who are very eager for reconciliation, and they're hoping that he will affirm the statement, one of the Holy Trinity suffered, uh, which of course is uh, very uh, standard in, in our usage in the Orthodox faith. And uh, Rome eventually comes to accept this, but at that moment, the Pope refused to say, one of the Holy Trinity suffered. And so you have the automatic question, well then, who suffered? And uh, they uh, were tending to say, well, only the humanity suffered. Hmm. But then how can humanity, uh, it doesn't exist on its own. Every instance of human nature occurs when it's connected, right, with a uh, hypostasis. Uh, our, our personhood. So uh, it uh, was a, uh, a real setback to the uh, reconciliation efforts. Back. Uh, that's the end of section three. Um, instead of having our discussion here, we want to bring online, we're very happy uh, to have Dr. Emanuel Gurgis. Uh, with us. He's calling in from Nashville, Tennessee. He's the CEO of Agora University. And of course, we heard him speak. Uh, Dr. Gurgis, welcome to Ancient Faith Today. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, um, I'm so appreciative that you called in. We don't have a lot of time now, but I, I'd like right. you to give whatever uh, comments uh, you would like to. And I would like to invite you, if you have the time to stay at the end, uh, because there are many, many questions that are coming in and would love to have your voice also. But please go ahead, Doctor. Thank you so much. And Father Tom, you know, as as, um, as you mentioned a little while earlier, uh, the statement that Chalcedon is somehow overturning uh, what Ephesus accomplished might be shocking, right? And uh, so I yes. wanted to shed some light on that statement that, you know, please. when please. when the initial uh, council happened, historically speaking, uh, as stated actually by even other scholars, that the Oriental uh, Orthodox family saw that this was the case. Um, I even saw it in, in uh, some of the comments that uh, Dr. Budanev might, might have made uh, a little earlier. Uh, and what, uh, you know, again, historically, typically, uh, as when a council was held, it certainly affirmed the faith of the previous council. And at Chalcedon, um, uh, I'm afraid that, that this never happened with the 12 anathemas, uh, as, as were stated by St. Cyril. So this was historically the case. However, since then, there have been, you know, the, as some of the scholars mentioned, the fifth council clarifying this language. And, of course, multiple attempts of reconciliation happened throughout history between both families. And so, you know, at, at this stage, uh, uh, what I'd like to do is to discern for our listeners between, you know, two concepts, the essence of faith and the form of expression. Um, you know, the, the essence of faith, I, I believe uh, both families are in total agreement that both families reject Eutychian monophysitism yes. as well as yes. Nestorian diophysitism. And, yes. and so I think we are very much aligned on the essence of faith. Uh, what remains to, to be sorted out, I guess, is the form of expression. 
um, uh, and of course, having uh, uh, read uh, Chalcedon through a Cyrillian lens, that uh, should very much um, facilitate this task for for both families. Uh, Dr. Gurgis, do you agree that the um, the term physis is seen differently uh, among the Oriental Orthodox than it is among the Chalcedonian Orthodox? Um, uh, yes, as a matter of fact, I, I explore this uh, a little bit in, in my own uh, doctoral work, um, where even even you know when you look at something like the the, the Lamb Patristic uh, lexicon, you'll see that the um, the word thesis uh, is one of its um, uh, main translations is actually reality. So in the Alexandrian mind, if you if if you're asking an Alexandrian how how many fusis do you think Christ has, and the the, the interpretation is uh, of the word is reality. So you're asking me how many realities does Christ have? Well, obviously one. Whereas you know in 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 other areas fusis might have been used as nature, and so it would be natural to say well mm-hmm. you know he he has. To nature, so so definitely the the the, the word in, in the Alexandrian mind means you know concrete reality. Is there a word in Arabic that is is different that is used for the term nature as Chalcedonians use the term nature to refer to essence or substance? Um, I would be hesitant. To, uh, to I mean, th- th- there is the direct translation of, of the word, you know, uh, uh, nature, which is uh, tabia, uh, w- and if we use the word reality, we would say waqa. But I am I am hesitant to to use Arabic uh, at this stage because Arabic well, is uh, is not well uh, developed in in, uh, in this arena. Uh, Okay, I apologize. Then uh, whatever the, the theological language that's causing the the sort of misunderstanding, whether it is in Coptic or whether it is in Syriac or, um, you know, were they were they doing theology just in Greek? The, my point in is, Greek. yes, but what is the cause of the misunderstanding or not misunderstanding, but the, the, the difference in understanding of this term, physis? It's, it's, just, uh, it's just like uh, in, in, in our modern word, uh, world, uh, Father Tom, when, when we use certain English words that might be understood uh, differently in, in Great Britain than it is in the United States. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, like uh, we use the word boot, <laughs> right and and uh, th- that might mean uh, a shoe in America, but it might mean right. mean the right. trunk uh, of a car in mm-hmm. in England. Yeah. So, so Good. obviously, how and 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 look, we're we're in the twenty first century, six hours by plane. Imagine <laughs> a, a world where there was no Facebook or or Twitter. <laughs> right, uh, right, right. So obviously, okay. Certain well, words might. That's have very helpful. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Humphrey, any comments or questions for Dr. Gurgis? Um, yes, I, I wanted to ask him in terms of etymology, you know, in the Greek, there there, there really is a big semantic over, uh, overlap between monos and hismiahen. They, they both can mean alone, they both can mean one. But so for me, I think it's, I, I think, I think it has more to do with connotation. And the fact that mono mm-hmm. came to be, um, came to be a, a, a used of heresy and so it's not charitable then to use it of those who are making it very clear that they believe that uh, Christ is truly and properly God and truly and properly man and that the manhood isn't swallowed up. So I mean I wonder whether you're stuck on the etymological um, uh, idea that they're completely different words or whether we can see this more in terms of connotation and how they've been applied and and then we, ima- we it amounts to the same thing we would not use that term for oriental orthodox because they've made it very clear that they're 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 not eutychians D- does that does that ring true to you 
Yes. So, so I mean, I think it's a mix of both, uh, uh, Doctor, because uh, on, on the one hand, you know, the, the word carries certain baggage, uh, having been used within the Utikian context. But nonetheless, um, I, I, I view mono more like a singularity as mm-hmm. opposed to mia, meaning a unitary um, so when when we're speaking about miaphysis, perhaps uh, a uh, a direct translation would be a unitary reality, as mm-hmm. opposed to a sing a single uh, or a, yeah. a singular reality sure. or a singular no, I, nature. I, under, yeah. I understand what you're saying. I'm just saying when we do etymological studies of the words, we can see that both terms are used for both things. Although you're absolutely right that Mia doesn't tend to, to mean alone very often, but sometimes it can. So, you know, I, right. I just, I don't want to get us stuck, a stuck on say an right. etymological fallacy that doesn't quite work and say, I, I end up at the same place that you do, but I would do it through connotation yeah. and through the fact that it's been, it's been used um, in a derogatory way of Eutychians and right. we wouldn't want to so, use that yeah. of you. I, excuse me for interrupting here. Uh, Dr. Gurgis, we would like to invite you to join us at the end of the program if you would like to, uh, Trudy will be on the other line. She can talk to you about that. We really appreciate it, but we do want to get to the next uh, section of the program, section four. We thank you so much for your participation and especially thank you for uh, calling in. That was really very, very helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. We are now at part four. Is reconciliation possible? Here we go. Part four. Is reconciliation possible? In this section, we want to explore more specifically what separates us and ask the question, what needs to happen to make unity even a possibility? And more importantly, is reconciliation all that important? We were honored to speak with His Grace Bishop Daniel Findikian of the Armenian Orthodox Church, who has strong convictions about this in terms of the current state of our world. In our understanding of the current context of our brotherhood and sisterhood as as Orthodox, or, you know, if we insist Eastern and uh, and Oriental Orthodox, um, you know, what's happening in the world around us, in Ukraine, in in Palestine, in Armenia, uh, certainly in Georgia in the recent past, uh, and I could go on and on. This is the context in which we must be doing our ecumenical discussions. Uh, we, you know, you say we do not share communion, and on paper, that's absolutely correct. The reality is that any Syriac Orthodox or Syrian Orthodox in Syria, in Damascus or Aleppo, uh, dodging you know, bombs, or in Gaza, or in the occupied territories uh, of Palestine, uh, or in Armenia, for that matter, who is seeking to, to receive and be a part of the body of Christ, is not going to be refused um, by because he's a non-Chalcedonian or because he's a Chalcedonian. These questions are in many ways so out of date um, given the circumstances of the world today. And I know that that's an approach that is criticized by some, and I stand by it wholeheartedly. Um, we must be thinking eschatologically as good Orthodox. I think the time has come of looking at the world around us to be thinking and reading our Gospels uh, the eschatological passages, uh, right, in the Gospels, uh, Matthew and elsewhere, we need to be reading those with some urgency yeah. that may not have been as imminent uh, even 50 years ago as it is now. Um, and I think we, um, we, we will be judged for that. I'm a bishop of the church, and I will be judged no less or more harshly than a, a, than a Russian Orthodox bishop or a, uh, a, a Serbian Orthodox bishop. Uh, or anyone else. Um, we had, this is no longer business to be taken around a table. Um, our our communion with among all Eastern and Oriental Orthodox. Um, this is something of of immense urgency. And the dialogue has revealed that the differences, while real, are not impossible to get over mm. as one thought. Right, with both sides affirming the full divinity and full humanity of Christ in a manner that respects the theological expressions and concerns 
of each tradition. For one thing, I think that the uh, the onus is on the Eastern Orthodox, uh, we who are Chalcedonian Orthodox. I think that that we should be the ones to kind of lead this because, for one thing, it's 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 really up to us to uh, to understand where they're coming from because if if we truly desire for the uh, the Oriental churches to be to be reunified with to be to become part of the Orthodox Church at large, and if we consider ourselves to be the the una sancta, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, then then we have a responsibility within the Eastern Orthodox Church to reach out to them, to fully understand uh, where they're coming, to persuade rather than attack, to persuade them, and uh, you know to to try to sit down at the table and to take seriously uh, the work that needs to be done, research and writing and publishing. Um, beyond just small consultations, like to start getting bishops involved and things like that to, to grow these. Uh, ultimately, though, I, I do believe that the other councils, that the uh, that an idea of agreeing to disagree where where the uh, the third council is, is, the, is the cutoff point for some churches and, you know, other churches can have uh, can have other councils and we can just agree to disagree. I don't think that that is. Uh, I don't think that's an effective or or possible way of reunifying. I think that there's a single or or continuous movement of theology throughout all the councils and even beyond those councils, uh, beyond the seven councils to the provincial councils, going up through the Polemite Council, all the way up to the Council of Jerusalem, which uh, which had to deal with uh, you know with the rise of of kind of Westernism in the East. All these are are cut from the same cloth. The bishops worked hard. There was a a desire to uh, for all the bishops to have to work these things out in these councils, to have to struggle and and learn to work together and uh, establish a, a theology that was unanimous rather than just uh, a teaching of one individual. And of course, at all the councils, there were important figures whose theology loomed large, like St. Cyril at Ephesus and Chalcedon. Uh, but I think the councils themselves, the conciliar tradition, is something that we need to to maintain and and see that as the way forward. And the Eastern Orthodox then have this responsibility to persuade, you know, our our Oriental brethren to accept these councils and to unify on a proper grounds rather than just this this agreement to disagree. The four adverbs used at Chalcedon, that is, without confusion, without change, without separation, and without division, these four adverbs balance and clarify everything. And they can also be found in liturgical and other texts of the non-Chalcedonian churches. All these elements prevent from lapsing into Ill illegitimate extremes and are a common ground for reconciliation. The ethos, John, hmm. that I've experienced, and, and so, so many people say it, uh, Chalcedonian Christians visiting non-Chalcedonian churches, the ethos is the same. Yeah, Just, I've heard this. And, and so we marvel at that, I think. 1,500 years of separation, and the ethos is the same. This is incredible. It has to be the work of the Holy Spirit. So often, usually, you know, in church history, when there's a schism, the group that breaks off in time gets more and more uh, in error, and most often, there's more and more splintering. Yeah. So we, we see the reverse here, with the ethos remaining... Uh, virtually the same. Of course, there's always room for uh, local customs, small tea traditions, right? Yeah. So that all, I think, yeah. is, is grounds for great optimism. This is sort of the advantage of the uh, North American and Western European diaspora, although it's also similar to the Middle East in some ways, in that, uh, well, there are many places where non-Calcedonians and Calcedonians come into contact and have opportunities to get to know each other and see each other's prayer lives and to realize that 
our monastic lives, especially uh, for the Copts, I would say, and our uh, liturgical lives and our prayer lives are familiar to each other. I mean, familiar sort of upon immediate contact. And this is very valuable. And this is, I think, the uh, strongest driving reason to deal with these hideously complex um, philosophical problems. So there's that. And there's also, you know, when I was listing off to you the uh, places where the non calcedonians have churches, um, outside of, you know, in, in their home countries, all of these places, uh, whether it's Syria and Lebanon, whether it's the Holy Land, whether it's Egypt, Ethiopia, uh, which has had quite a horrible civil war in their Christian heartland in the north, uh, Eritrea, where the government har harshly persecutes the church, or Armenia, which is currently um, under existential threat from Azerbaijan. The, the, these are all places where the Christians are in need. There are two rather significant issues that will need to be worked out between our churches that we must bring up here. The first one comes out of the Sixth Ecumenical Council, which occurred in 680 in Constantinople, and could be seen as a further extension of Chalcedon. If Christ has two natures, does he also have two wills? The claim that his divine nature made all of the decisions, and his human nature just merely carried them out, was a heresy declared at the Sixth Council called Monothletism. We remember Christ's words in the Garden of Gethsemane, Lord, take this cup from me, nevertheless not my will, but thine be done. Chalcedonian Christology points to St. Maximus the Confessor and St. Andrew of Crete, as the primary defenders of the two wills of Christ. So, spin forward to the modern-day dialogues attempting progress toward reconciliation. How are the two wills dealt with in the Joint Commission dialogues between the Oriental and Eastern Orthodox representatives? So, the way that the dialogue talked about will is, and I'll, I'll quote it here, both families agree that he who wills and acts is always the one hypostasis of the Logos incarnate. Now, this is fine, of course. I mean, it's a totally orthodox statement. You know, so that's, that's an affirmation of this single subject Christology, that there's not two Christs, there's not a divine and a human acting separately. It, it, it's fine as it goes. But the danger here, if you don't accept the theology of Maximus the Confessor, which was made mandatory for Chalcedonians at the Sixth Ecumenical Council, that it's very hard to avoid one of two things. So either Christ's personal will is distinguishable from the will of God the Father, and then implicitly each hypostasis of the Trinity would have its own will. And everybody agrees that's absurd. I don't think non-Chalcedonians think that any more than anyone does. Or that you have to say that Christ has a divine will uh, only. And in addition to creating great problems for biblical exegesis, you know, the agony in the garden becomes very hard to interpret as anything other than play acting. Um, it brings us back around to something that's quite close to actual Eutychian monophysitism. So if there's going to be unity, we cannot avoid of talking about the problem of how Maximus's theology can be rendered in language acceptable to non-Chalcedonians. That is, can one nature language get us there and avoid these problems? And I, I think that's never really been clarified. And it is impossible to say that we have an identity of faith yeah. without uh, addressing this issue. Does Christ have two wills? Well, it, it stems from the question, does this God, does Christ have two natures, right? So, and and that that complexifies the discussion because okay do natures have a will or do persons have a will persons do natures do not do so you can say for example a person is hungry but you don't say human nature is hungry right so action is always done by a person not a nature so the question becomes if a nature has a will doesn't it make them that nature a person and if that is the case then would christ have two persons i don't quite understand where that would 
come from? Uh, the idea that will is according to nature was was already a standard trope uh, for a few centuries prior to the rise of monothelitism. Uh, St. Maximus was not saying anything strange. Uh, so, for, for example, when St. Maximus uh, is engaged with the heretic Pyrrhos, uh, he says, if one suggests that a willer is implied in the notion of the will, then by the exact inversion of this principle of reasoning, a will implied in the notion of a willer. Thus, will you say that because of the one will of the superessential divinity, there's only one hypothesis, as did Sibelius, or that because there are three hypostases, there are also three wills, and therefore three natures as well. For the canons and definitions of the fathers say that the distinction of wills implies the distinction of na natures. Even Arius said so. And what he's referring to here is that uh, at the time when, when St. Athanasius is, is dealing with the Arians, already in St. Athanasius, there's the understanding that will is according to nature. The Arians agreed with him on that, but the Arians said that it's obvious that, uh, that Jesus had a different will than his father, and therefore he has to be a different nature. So they used it in, in the opposite way than St. Athanasius was. St. Athanasius says the exact opposite. He, uh, so, so, for example, there's the, the famous instance of Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. And it would seem like there's this, this tension of wills. Okay, that happens in the Garden of Gethsemane. And the Arians interpret that as evidence that, that because there's this tension of wills, Jesus' will, which is according to nature, must be different than the Father's, and therefore having a separate will or different will, he would have a different nature altogether. And, and so St. Athanasius responds to the Arians with this. This is in his uh, book on the Incarnation. He says, Christ manifests here two wills, Theothilamata, two wills, the human will, which belongs to the flesh, and the divine will, which belongs to God. So St. Saint Saint, uh, Athanasius, rather, he, he absolutely challenges what the Arians are saying. He's saying, yes, absolutely, there are two wills. It's that human will that has to come in, is, is coming into line with the divine will. But according to his divine will, that is the same as the Father's will, because that's according to nature. Uh, the Cappadocians will continue that. They'll, they'll use sort of will and energy, or, which is, you know, action, uh, you know, or movement. Uh, they'll use them sort of somewhat synonymously and say that the evidence that, that God is one, for example, St. Gregory of Nyssa, uh, the evidence that God is one is that it's a single energy that comes from the Father through the Son in the Spirit. And, and then he'll make clear that... that uh, you know, there's a sense of it's the one energy according to the nature, but we we understand it or we interact with it through the three persons. So it is one nature, but it, it comes from the Father through the Son in the Spirit. The second significant separating factor is the belief that the goal of salvation is deification or theosis. There is a concern among some Chalcedonian Orthodox that the Coptic Church in particular does not accept the doctrine of theosis, which springs out of St. Athanasius himself, where he said God became man so that men may become gods. The reason for that concern is that the late Pope Shenouda of the Coptic Church actually condemned theosis as a heresy. Even though Pope Shenouda obviously uh, held to the non-Chalcedonian uh, formula of one incarnate nature. The In practice, his rejection of uh, theosis went around and was functionally Nestorian. That is, he believed that humanity and divinity are wholly incompatible in the, and cannot exist in the same being. He called the idea of theosis shirk, which means mm -hmm was the Muslim theological term for associating what's not God with God, hmm. which is a Muslim uh, criticism of the Incarnation. So I think really, aside from any discussion of Chalcedon as such, for any kind of ecumenical progress to be made with the Coptic Church, they have a responsibility to make it unambiguously clear that Shenouda's writings on theosis are wholly unacceptable, not just, you know, in Chalcedonian terms, but in historical non-Chalcedonian terms. I mean, they're, they're simply heretical by the standards of the theology of Cyril Alexandria. There was a, a Coptic scholar named Dr. George Babawi who was excommunicated by the former Patriarch of Alexandria, the Coptic Church, 
uh, Shenouda, Pope Shenouda. And uh, he, he eventually immigrated to the U.S. He lived in Indiana for a while. He actually ended up becoming a member of a Chalcedonian church there. And I had, uh, I had friends that knew him. Uh, so it's through his writings and lectures that I uh, came into contact with that I, I heard of, I found about his story. And his story is, is one in which he, is, uh, he was involved with a, a dialogue. I think it was with the Russian church at the time. He was involved with one of these dialogues between the Coptic church and one of the Chalcedon, uh, Chalcedonian churches. And uh, he affirmed that, that the proper understanding of salvation could be described as theosis. And that did not sit well with Pope Shenouda. Uh, he was uh, adamantly against this. And so uh, he excommunicated him. And, um, and he uh, uh, eventually, after Pope Shenouda passed away, the, the current patriarch of the Coptic Church, uh, Tuadros, um, right before Dr. Babawi's death in 2020, um, about a year or so before his death, he, he restored him. He took away, he lifted the excommunication against him. And there were bishops uh, in the Coptic Church who were still upset with this. They said that it shouldn't have been, the excommunication should not have been lifted because Dr. Babawi was not repentant of his, his idea of theosis. So that's a big issue for me. Maybe it's not the official teaching of the Coptic Church as a whole, for example, and maybe it's not the official teaching of like the Ethiopian or the Armenian Church, but if it is indeed uh, something that a good many bishops or maybe uh, seminary professors are teaching, this idea that theosis is heretical, then that's, that would be a, a very big difference in theology between the Eastern Orthodox and the Oriental. But then Coptic priest Father Anthony Paul addressed the issue of theosis as more of a language problem, saying that the Coptic Church actually does believe in theosis. So on our end, for example, we didn't use the word theosis much um, in our church. Um, we were using sanctification as a word. We were using all sorts of words, but we very much believe in theosis, right? But the word theosis in Arabic... Um, Sounds like you're saying that I'm going to become God by nature, which is a heresy, right? So we have someone like Pope Shenouda who wrote against theosis and called it a heresy, right? So then you have all these Easterners who read that and like, oh, wow, they call theosis heresy. They're totally messed up. So then they go running back to the church and say, oh, the cops are actually really not orthodox. They don't believe in theosis, right? Without trying to understand where are we coming from and what are we saying? Do we believe in it? Yes, we do. Do we always call it that? No, we don't. Um, and you need to understand our Islamic context, right? When you're in, surrounded by a bunch of Muslims who already don't like us calling Jesus God, okay? And then you're saying everyone gets to be God, right? Then they're not going to take that well, and they start persecuting us more, right? So from a pastoral perspective, our Pope needs to care very much about what terminology that we use, which somebody who's growing up freely in the West isn't going to appreciate. Within a Chalcedonian context, the term theosis has had a very long life in Arabic, uh, ta'alluh or uh, ta'li. Uh, and if you look at uh, the medieval translations of Greek patristic texts, for example, that start to be translated in the ninth century, uh, you find theosis, this word, ta'alluh, ta'li, um, in the texts. You find it in Ottoman era, um, uh, theological texts and translations from the Greek. And it's extremely common, of course, in uh, modern Chalcedonian Orthodox discourse in Syria and Lebanon and the Holy Land. So there's, at least in the experience of the Chalcedonian churches, which exist also in Egypt, uh, the, there's never been worry that this term would cause problems uh, or misunderstandings with Muslims. Uh, I mean, and if you think about it in practice, for Muslims, the incarnation is scandal enough. I mean, uh, the doctrine of theosis doesn't create any more scandal because already this ontological union between God and man happens in the incarnation. In addition to these two issues, more understanding needs to be pursued regarding some unique practices of the Armenian Church. In our longer interview, we asked Bishop Daniel about a couple of these, including the use of unleavened bread for the Eucharist and communal confession. I would encourage you to watch that entire interview. But 
What about the long history of the widely unknown practice in the Armenian church of Mata? I'd never heard until this project of the practice of, I guess it's called Mata. And it Mata. Has, Mata. Mata. Mata, yes. okay. Yes. So Thanks you do, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, tell us, what is that? And uh, help us understand uh, the practice itself and what's behind it. So, so what... Again, yeah, yeah, what, what folks will tell you is that it, it's a service of animal sacrifice. Wow. The Armenians uh, practice animal sacrifice. Uh, if you go to Google, that's what it says. And if you, you ask people, that's what it says. Well, OK, yeah, it, it involves the sacrifice of an animal. But, but the way that's understood in the Middle Ages, right, which means it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a sacrament of dinner. Uh, you know, we go to the grocery store and we buy a lovely package of whatever roast we want to cook for dinner that night. And it's all hermetically sealed and beautiful. And. Um, the reality, as we all know, and I think we know, is that in most of the world, it's not that pretty um, is that that's an animal. And that's an animal that was created by God with love. It's a part of God's creation. And um, so we should not simply be slaughtering God's creation in order for ourselves to eat. Um, that doesn't mean we're all called to be vegans either. It means that we need to give thanks um, to the God who created that animal. Um, and uh, before we before we partake of that animal, as we have the privilege to do as human beings, um, so that's what that this what this right of animal sacrifice uh, means. Um, that's what it's about. It's lost really in the Western world. It's still here in Armenia, very much practiced. Um, there's a one of the old sixth century, seventh century churches that's a five minute walk from where I'm sitting right now. Uh, until very recently was one of the churches where people would come and they'd bring an animal. If they were very wealthy, they'd bring a goat. Uh, if they were not as wealthy, they'd bring a chicken or a dove. And uh, we have a beautiful service um, in our ritual books, which is a, a service of thanksgiving. It's pure and simple, a service of thanksgiving that sounds, you know, in spirit and even in theology, not too different from our Eucharistic prayers in all of our churches. It's about thanksgiving to God for creation. Um, and, uh, uh, and giving thanks for this gift that God has given us. When we come back, we'll learn about the official dialogues between the Eastern and Oriental Orthodox churches that have taken place in more recent decades. All right, welcome back. Uh, there was a lot there in that particular segment. Um, I, I wanted to just mention a couple of things. First of all, I really appreciated Father Joseph making the clarification uh, in our Eastern Orthodox understanding, our Chalcedonian Orthodox understanding, I thought it was a very good point that he said, will is according to nature. And the, the proof of this is the Trinity, because there are not three wills within the Trinity, right? So I, I thought that was really very, very helpful. Um, the, the comments about our closeness to one another, these two families of churches, is very important. I know that there's going to be some bristling to the comments of Bishop Daniel, uh, the Armenian bishop, about the reality of the Middle East in there. Uh, you know, that's their reality. Uh, I, I think that in the time of war, uh, in the time of upheaval, they've been under uh, Islamic oppression for uh, since, you know, what, 650, um, there is just a different reality there. So I think we as Americans would have very great difficulty sort of understanding that mentality there. Um, and then, of course, about the wills and so forth, we, we got stuck again on the idea of, of nature and person. Uh, Dr. Humphrey, comments? So... Uh, just what I said before, I think it helps us from our perspective to remember that there are two what's in Jesus, but one who, and that may help uh, in, in furthering the discussion to keep it that simple when we're talking to Miaphysites. Um, I actually stuck on something else, and that was the difficulty that they have, um, some of them many with, way with theosis and what we've seen about that and how that was discussed. And um, uh, it's evident that you know, that, that, that our friends 
uh, haven't got the development that we have from St. Maximus through St. Simeon to Palamus. But I, I think that we may be able to talk this through because they do have the raw material for theosis, so to speak. They do have St. Athanasius, and they also have an emphasis upon the God-man and the unity that should open them up to that idea. So in talking about this with, with uh uh, with my friend uh, Michael Ibrahim, who also appeared on this show, um, he agreed with me that that was a good opening there, and that um, that of course there are some that really do worry about it for the reasons that were discussed, but that 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 is a, 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 an open um, discussion that we could have with them, and it's not something that they're hardened against. So yeah, it I, I it seems helpful. like there are yeah there are practices and theological points in uh, Chalcedonian Orthodoxy, obviously with Palamas, we're talking about much later, um, that would not necessarily be present there, but they may actually accept these things. Yep. Um, and, and as uh, the one clip there that you played, John, they said, well, we talk about sanctification and so forth, and then there's a Islamic misunderstanding about this, so they just don't necessarily have that development. Um, Dr. Humphrey, I want to tell you, though, in the YouTube chat room, there were quite a few uh, comments about your uh, the use of what and who, mm -hmm. um, you know, that that nature is what and person is who. Um, and there there, you know, I, I don't think you can see the comments there, but yeah. they are they're they're pushing it back against that so maybe you can go into the chat well, room a little bit later and discuss that sure i mean i mean the most important thing we have to get going but the most important thing is that we have one subject in jesus christ and about that we we agree what we don't agree with with the meophysites is that we can speak about and we can speak coherently and it's important for us to speak about there being two natures and therefore two wills and um, to talk about there being two natures doesn't mean that there's two persons, that there's two subjects. And I, I think this is, this, is a, a, this is a really important discussion that needs to be had with our friends. All right, very good. John, comments before uh, we go to the next? Just thankful for the conversation. I was encouraged by a comment in the chat room about how refreshing it is to have real, ironic theological discussion by people who know what they're talking about. And it's just uh, very helpful, especially to those of us who are laity, uh, who don't think theologically. I didn't go to seminary. I'm trying to learn here. All I know is I wish we were together. And so, you know, it's more out of a heart yeah. than the theological uh, understanding. So, Well, it is important because there's a lot at stake here. There's a lot at stake in terms of our unity, uh, in terms of our, our common witness to the world. And we do need each other in terms of our strength, right? So this is something that's important. Uh, I think many times internet comments, internet discourse can oversimplify things and make things look very black and white. And they would say things like, well, you know, the Oriental Orthodox, it's easy. They should just accept the seven ecumenical councils and be done with it, right? Like give them some chrism and let's, let's get this over with. But you know, life is more complicated than that. And so there has to be this dialogue and, and that's what we're going to hear about now. Uh, so anyway, uh, let's take a very, very quick break. Don't go away. We're going to hear a quick message. We'll come right back for section five. Have the Ancient Faith Radio app? It's the best way to listen to Ancient Faith Radio because you can create playlists, follow your favorite podcasters and shows, and get notifications for what's new. Download today for iPhone or Android. All right, uh, we are back for section five, and section five now is talking about the um, 
the the reunion you know how what are these dialogues that are happening are they helpful are they just you know professional theologians talking to one another or are they making progress let's go ahead and listen to section five part five the dialogues Much has been said about the so-called Second Agreement at the Joint Commission of the Theological Dialogue between the Oriental Orthodox and Eastern Orthodox Churches. This statement reflects what the two families agreed upon in Chambassy, Switzerland. The official dialogue began in 1985 in Chambassy, that is very close to Geneva, which, by the way, is my parish place and the two appointed presidents were Metropolitan Damaskinos of Switzerland, of the Patriarchate of Constantinople, and Metropolitan Bishoy of Daniet, of the Coptic Orthodox Patriarchate of Alexandria. The first meetings until 1993 gave very good results with communique and recommendations. Very interesting. Very near your home. Were you there? Yes, I was. So I was in the corridors, you know. <laughs> but yes, I followed up very carefully oh. what was going on because I was, of course, very excited because I had this personal interest for the dialogue. Dr. Peter Butenev comments that there was some amount of surprise about how close the parties ended up being to each other. Yeah, I mean, the, the the very tangible dialogue is is one that has taken place over um, eight meetings, you know, from the 1960s to the 1990s, uh, four unofficial meetings and then four official meetings, you know, official meaning the participants were ap appointed by the hierarchy of, of, of each of the churches, you know, kind of formally. Uh, so there was a, a, a dialogue that is on the whole very practical and also on the whole very realistic. It doesn't sweep issues under the rug. It speaks about councils. It speaks about counting the councils. It speaks about feces, <laughs> one nature, two natures. It, it really gets in there. It speaks about saints. Um, and uh, the dialogue in a way was so radically positive in its conclusions that I think it surprised and scared a lot of the churches. Uh, it's like, wait a minute, we didn't actually send you guys out there to bring us together. <laughs> uh, but lo and behold, uh, that's what they did. And so uh, the reception of that dialogue, which is now in its like 30 plus year period, uh, these things do take time, you know, John. I mean, the, the, the ecumenical councils took decades to be received. Uh, but, uh, y you know, there, there are, are reactions of real resistance to that dialogue, such as from Mount Athos. There are, uh, there's a great welcome of the dialogue, but um, only in recent years there are attempts to really begin to restart the dialogue. There were 10 affirming statements that came out of that second agreement. And in my extensive interview with Orthodox history professor Dr. David Ford, he goes point by point in affirming and celebrating what was agreed upon in those 10 statements. I would encourage you to take time to listen to my entire interview with him about this. What I will point out here is Dr. Ford's more cautionary reading of statements 8 and 9. Here's number eight. Both families accept the first three ecumenical councils full scale, <laughs> which form our common heritage. In relation to the later four councils of the Orthodox Church, the Orthodox state, that for them, the above points one to seven are indeed the teachings uh, also of the four later councils totally in line with the first three. Yes. While the Oriental Orthodox consider this statement of the Orthodox as their interpretation, a little bit kind of fuzzy there, with this understanding, the Oriental Orthodox respond to it positively. Uh, I, I really think the Orthodox would, would want to see a stronger endorsement by the Oriental Orthodox of at least the doctrinal statements 
of the later four councils. So in that eighth statement, Dr. Ford was looking for more than just an acknowledgement on the part of the Oriental Orthodox that this is a matter of different interpretations, even though they were willing to respond to it, quote, positively. Dr. Ford also winced a bit at agreed statement number nine. In light of our agreed statement on Christology, as well as of the above common affirmations, yes, we have now clearly understood that both families have always loyally maintained the same authentic Orthodox Christological faith and the unbroken continuity of the apostolic tradition, though they have used Christological terms in different ways. John, um, we can rejoice that we have such agreement now, but to then claim that there always was the same Christological faith. Really, I, I think it's kind of slanderous on the all those involved in those many, many years of efforts at reconciliation. Didn't they understand? Why was it then that they couldn't see being 1,500 years closer, you know, uh, to the scene, so to speak, why was it that they couldn't see that we are really saying, meaning the same thing, just using uh, different vocabulary? So I, 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 I just hesitate. Uh, the Orthodox, of course, we fully understand. It's always been the same faith that that uh, these uh, that we have always been proclaiming. We would have we would have a huge question about the. Uh, as we were talking about the establishment of the alternate hierarchy in Syria, that's now known as the Jacobite Church, mm -hmm. uh, because of those efforts by Jacob Haradai, right? Secretly ordaining, establishing the uh, ordaining priests, non Chalcedonian, and establishing that alternate hier hierarchy. I think it's a very real question that we have. Why was that effort made if we really were holding? the same faith. Earlier, Dr. Buteneff mentioned the resistance of a committee of monks on Mount Athos. Father Joseph Lucas helps us understand that and how we should react to it. Um, so the last statement was 93 from these dialogues, and it was the year later in 1994 that the monks of Mount Athos then responded back. Um, and a lot of their critiques are ones that I, I also share, concerns that, uh, that I also share. Uh, so for one thing was this idea that, um, um, you know, it comes out in the documents that that we can sort of agree to disagree about the acceptance of additional councils beyond the third. So so this is something that comes across in these joint statements is that uh, since we mean the same thing when we talk about the, the two natures, and there was a lot of good agreement there in terms of meaning the same thing when we talk about the two natures and the hypostatic union and that sort of thing. But then the conclusions are, well, maybe it's not necessary to kind of like, you know, rock the boat and insist that the uh, Oriental churches accept the subsequent councils. Um, and again, I think that would be problematic because for multiple reasons, um, for one thing, it's, it's uh, you know, there are other heresies that are dealt with at these councils that um, those could arise again, or they could th try to take root again within the church. Secondly, it, it kind of, uh, one of the things that the Athenite Fathers are concerned with is the idea that holy tradition uh, is a constant stream, and, uh, and therefore it, you have to locate it somewhere. So if we're saying that these additional councils are unnecessary, we're saying that that stream of holy tradition through the Orthodox Church uh, it, it kind of stopped, or these things were unnecessary. They can kind of fall away. And so they particularly took issue with a flippant remark they quote from Pope Shenouda. Uh, Pope Shenouda was, uh, was recorded as saying to the, uh, to the Chalcedonian Orthodox, he said, you have seven ecumenical synods. If you lose one, you're not losing a lot. So this kind of flippant uh, uh, remark and this kind of attitude, well, it's no big deal. We, you know, we can just kind of agree to disagree. I think is is why there was a lot of concern 
uh, about the way this is being handled. When we come back, we'll speak with Father Chad Hatfield about the significant number of Oriental Orthodox seminarians at St. Vladimir's Orthodox Theological Seminary. We'll also speak with members of our panel about what can be done to get to know our estranged brothers and sisters better today. Stay tuned. All right, welcome back. That was the fifth of six sections. And um, we're going to ask you now, if you would like to call in, you can go ahead and call in now at 1-855-AF-RADIO. That's 1-855-237-2346. Let me say it again, 1-855-237-2346. We will take your calls after the end of the final section. So, uh, you know, it seems to me, and I think, Dr. Edith, you're familiar with a lot of these official dialogues that happen between churches and so forth. And, and often, I think there is some pressure to kind of uh, come up with a solution, right, uh, that has dogged us for 1,500 years. And so, as Father Joseph said, you know, there were a lot of good things about that, but they kind of jumped the gun in saying, well... Um, you only have to uh, accept the first three and we'll just forget about the other four. Yeah, well, I, I don't think they quite said that, but I think that the language um, uh, that, that, that uh, Dr. Ford points to, particularly in uh, the Eighth Declaration, implies it. That um, we recognize that we have always had the same faith then implies that nothing further has to be done on the part um, of uh, in, in terms of uh, agreeing dogmatically and, and disagreeing. I want to say, too, having been part of these kinds of discussions, I don't think it's just that one wants to find a solution, but that as you meet together with the same people day after day and week after week and you have discussions and so on, you become good friends. And so there is a kind of a, um, there is a, kind of a, a personal um, union that you that, that that you have that I think can come to overshadow the thinking that's going on um, in 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 such uh, situations so that you you feel a unity that may be true right. in one way but isn't true dogmatically and so I I agree with Dr Ford's caution that um, we can't just say all the disagreement from the past was was simply misunderstanding because that's slanderous of the people that thought on both sides that thought it was so serious that they had to they had to break communion, but but um, um, also um, that that it is a problem from our point of view to say, well, did the Holy Spirit stop working after three councils? Evidently not. And and, and the whole business of, of whether theosis is something that can be accepted or not would be one of those examples in point. Sure. For us, that's really important. Of course. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and, and again, I, I want to say there have been other statements like this about Roman Catholicism, and I'm not sure about Protestantism, but they they are sort of far-reaching statements. I'll say, well, you know, with a filioque way, we can both understand it uh, in a particular way, and I think it's it's um, not always helpful for for those kind of statements to be taken uh, with too much uh, 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 seriousness, right? The bishops ultimately are going to decide. Uh, John, any thoughts about five? That was, uh, it's a tough, tough it section. Is. It is. And, you know, you think about those dialogues, the last one held was 30 some years ago. So what does that tell us? Well, you could, you know, skeptically say, well, they're obviously not interested, or you could be more realistic and realize there are, have been a few other things that have been on the minds of our bishops, uh, both sure. in the Oriental and Eastern Orthodox churches. There have been, you know, uh, uh, schisms, there's been uh, wars, there's been violence, there's been you know, just safety issues. And so uh, I, it's not that there's not a willingness to, to talk. It's just sometimes so hard. It's an enormous task to get the right people together mm -hmm. in the room with enough time allocated to sort these things out. And then even if you sort them out theologically, the task of the practical traditions and practices and anathemas that have gone both ways it's a huge task, and we just need to pray that somehow it happens. Yeah, and, and, and the practical we need to have patience. Yeah, we need to have patience. This was fifteen, uh, you know, a long time we've been apart. So thirty years sounds yes. like a lot, but it really <laughs> yeah. isn't. Good point. It really isn't. Good point. Yeah, 
and and prayer will uh, help us also. Yeah. All right. Uh, we have some calls coming in, so you guys hold on the line. You can give us a call at one eight five five two three seven two three four six. And here we go with the final part of our documentary, and uh, we're really looking forward to hearing from you. All right, let's. Modeling unity while we pray for communion. Did you know that both St. Vladimir's and St. Tikhon seminaries have been welcoming Oriental Orthodox seminarians to their schools for decades? St. Vladimir's president is Father Chad Hatfield. You know, we've now reached a point where almost one quarter of our current almost 100 students would be from uh, an Oriental tradition. That's and amazing. And we actually, in addition to our three hierarchs chapel, where we pray twice daily, uh, there is a St. Thomas uh, chapel. And John, if you don't mind, I, 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 I'll, I'll pause right there to say we have three types of um, uh, Indian students who are Orthodox, Oriental Orthodox. Okay. Now, a lot of your listeners won't know that. The majority would be Malakaran Orthodox Syrian, um, in fact, we have 10 MDiv students, uh, one MA and four doctor of ministry students. Um, most of them come from, from American diocese, uh, although this year we have three uh, who are directly from India under Indian bishops. So that is, that's one group. Uh, and we actually have one of their um, bishops on our board of trustees. Uh, there's also the Malakaran Syrian Orthodox uh, Kanaya Archdiocese. That's a particularly distinct ethnic group, I would say, within that tradition. Uh, and we have one student in that group, and they're under the Syrian patriarch, Ignatius Ephraim II. Uh, and then there is um, the, the Indian group, uh, in addition, the Malakarn Syrian Orthodox Church, that are under patriarch Ignatius. And uh, we have one student who's, again, um, non-Calcedonian, but he's actually from the Syrian patriarchate, but he is of Arab background from Damascus. So that just gives you a little bit of a picture of how the complexities are there. But I think the beautiful thing about our St. Thomas Chapel, with the blessing of the Catholicos and their patriarch, our students pray together. Mm. And I love going down myself to, 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 to pray from time to time. Others do as well. Um, and then we have a Coptic, a St. Mark's Chapel, a Coptic Orthodox okay. uh, Chapel on campus. Dr. David Ford spoke about St. Tikhon Seminary, and in particular, the Malankara Indian Orthodox students. You know, at St. Tikhon's, we have had Malankar Indian students for quite some time. They are in the uh, fifth of the five Oriental Orthodox churches, the Malankar, the Indian Orthodox Church. Their history is so different from the history of the other four, the uh, Syrian, Ethiopian, Egyptian, and Armenian. They only came in to this uh, rejection of Chalcedon only in the year 1665. Hmm. Yes, and uh, the basic understanding there is Portuguese missionaries, Roman Catholic missionaries, uh, you know, the Portuguese, we recall the colony of Goa, the Portuguese colony mm -hmm. on the western shore uh, of India. They were pressuring the, the Thomas Christians, they were hearkening back to St. Thomas, uh, to come under Rome, to accept Roman authority, and that their liturgy, which at that point was East Syrian, uh, would be Latinized. And... Uh, it, it threw the uh, Thomas Christians into turmoil. Some were more amenable to going in that direction than others. Uh, there was fierce resentment of that uh, uh, turmoil that was brought in by the Roman Catholic missionaries. And so finally, uh, as, as my Malankar students say, we begged for help. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it turns out in 1665 that the Syriac, non casadonian Archbishop of Jerusalem hmm. traveled to India and brought the Indian Christians who were rejecting Rome, bringing them under his wing and by extension under the authority okay. of uh, the, uh, the church in Syria. And that's when their liturgical 
uh, right, shifted from East Syria to West Syria. I always love to emphasize with, with these beloved students, and by the way, every one of them has been just so uh, sweet, <laughs> so uh, cooperative. Oh my goodness, their, their, their Christianity shines forth. So that's another reason for optimism. You know, how many how many seminarians oh uh, are there at St. Ticons that come from uh, the non-Calcedonian Oriental background? Yeah, we've had two, three, or four every year. Every year for wow. for about uh, fifteen or so years. Yeah. yeah, so we're really getting to know them, and uh, actually talking with uh, two of them yesterday, they said the real avenue of progress is going to be they think in North America oh. with their students attending not only. St. Tikhon's, but St. Vladimir's. Yes. And of course, that in itself, in itself, you know, that their hierarchs <laughs> would send their seminarians to uh, Chalcedonian schools. It, it just makes it so obvious. Yeah. They, uh, they're they on board with, with Chalcedon. We celebrated a few years ago while I was a primate, we celebrated Armenian Vespers in the chapel of the three hierarchs at St. Vladimir's by invitation of the dean. Yeah. Um, uh, that was historic, and that was absolutely appropriate, absolutely appropriate, um, as as we share, you know, everything else together. Yeah. No one is trying to swallow anybody up. At least we should agree on that. Seeing the way these two seminaries have expanded their tent to welcome, train, pray with, eat with, and get to know the Oriental Orthodox communities. What can we do as faithful Orthodox Christians to advance the appeal of our Lord that we all be one? None of us as laity will solve any remaining theological questions or the practical matters of how we worship liturgically, but we can start by being more charitable in our assumptions about each other. I believe so, so firmly that, you know, this is the kind of thing for which we need to be able to have civil conversation, you know, without people throwing bombs. Yeah. What we need to do is actually there needs to be more understanding of one another, because the way that I see what's happened, um, the analogy that I, I like to use is we're, we're a bunch of brothers that got in a, in a big, stupid fight. OK, we are having a dinner together at the table. We got in a huge fight and our, the fight was allegedly about our dad. Right. And so some of them say, no, it's politics. Some are like, no, it really was about my dad. The truth is probably somewhere in the middle. OK. And then in our tantrums, everybody left the house. Right. And everybody left the house claiming that we kicked the other person out. Right. Because everybody claims to be the Orthodox Church. Right. And so then we grew in isolation and then everybody told their kids um, all these stories about their uncles. Right. Of how dumb they were and how evil they were and what they did and what they said and, and how they did all these things. And then our kids repeat all the same things to each other. Right. And they're like, ha ha, see, they did this and all sorts of folklore like came out of it. The, the Easterners have a, a story of how the Council of Chalcedon, um, the church that the council was held in the Church of St. Euphemia, the martyr. Um, and so they say, oh, we put the council, the tome of Leo in her right hand and the tome of Dioscorus in her left hand. And we prayed. And in the morning when we came, we found the tome of Dioscorus under her feet. And I'm like, well, he didn't write one like that. That never happened. Right. And the story isn't even talked about at the council nor by any of the contemporaries, nor is it mentioned until like, I don't know how many hundred years later, right? So it's a made up story. On our end, we're like, no, no, no. Dioscorus was held under house arrest and was prevented from going. And then they condemned him for not showing him. That's not true either, right? No, he refused to go. He very willingly refused to go, right? So we made up all these stories and we tell people stuff about them um, and we call each other names. It's very easy that theologians sit in a room and become very uh, combative with uh, philosophical ideas and, and trying to uh, show, okay, the, you know, my heritage or my thought is more powerful than yours. This is not the spirit in which dialogue should happen. In fact, um, this reduces theological work into philosophical uh, work. Um, true theology is one that examines the reality of Christ. And therefore, um, my proposal for uh, a productive dialogue would be common encounter, common encounter. What does that look like? Perhaps monastic exchange, perhaps uh, a group of monks from the Eastern Orthodox Church would go and live 
in the Egyptian skeetis among Egyptian monks. And a group from the Egyptian skeetis would go to uh, Antioch or Russia and spend time with uh, Eastern Orthodox monks. Then they are able to perceive the encounter, perceive the life of prayer, perceive the liturgical life, and see Christ together. Then I think the best thing is to meet uh, one another and speak, discuss together, see that they have icons in their churches, to see how they venerate these icons, to see that they venerate the Virgin Mary and also the saints. We have many saints in common, uh, that is before the time of Chalcedon. So, uh, well, of course, many of these saints, uh, if they are of another tradition, why not uh, know about them? Why not be enriched by reading the monastic literature and also the patristic literature of all these Oriental Orthodox churches? Because uh, we can be enriched by all that. God forbid uh, the Lord will ask me and you, you know, uh, the end days were there and, and I was there in your midst. And why didn't you come to me mm. as one as one family, as, as, as my true church, my true churches. Why didn't you come to me hand in hand? I waited for you, I called you. Thank you for watching our presentation. And thank you to our panelists who were so generous with their time. I pray we all learned more about each other and that our hearts have been warmed with love for the entire Orthodox family. While we grieve over our temporary loss of unity around the body and blood of our Lord God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I do hope you'll take time to watch the entire interviews with all 10 of our panelists. There's so much in what they said that we did not have time to include in our documentary itself. You'll be enriched by their insights, even if you don't agree with everything they say. I leave you now with the words of our Lord in John 17. you and me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you loved me. All right. First of all, a uh, big shout out to John Maddox and to Simon for putting this tremendous documentary together. Uh, we're so grateful to you. You brought together an amazing team of scholars and clergy and bishops uh, to talk about this very serious issue. Now, obviously, we're just a you know, bunch of podcasters that are trying to bring light to this particular subject. So uh, we have some callers on the line. We also want to welcome, uh, again, uh, Dr. Emanuel Gurgis. Uh, he is here with us, so he'll be representing the um, Oriental Orthodox. Dr. Humphrey will be re representing the Eastern Orthodox and here is our first call. All right, Michael from Colorado. Michael, welcome to Ancient Faith Today. You're on the line with the team. Hi, uh, thank you for taking my call. Um, I, I think, am probably one of your only listeners who has been a member of both families. Um, I converted to Eth uh, Ethiopian Orthodoxy um, uh, after being a Protestant, um, and then moved back to the U.S. and couldn't find a parish near me, um, and so attended a Antiochian parish as a visitor for a period of time. Um, and eventually my wife and I kind of came to the realization, just our personal conclusion, that we were hearing the same thing at the Antiochian parish that we had been hearing um, 
you know, at the Ethiopian churches in Ethiopia. So wow. um, we just de- we decided, um, okay, so are we just going to not take communion for long periods of time? Um, you know, we had a small son; he needed communion as well, obviously. Um, or are we comfortable making the change? And we did make the change, and we didn't do it for any theological reasons. We just we did it because there was an Antiochian church just up the street from us. Um, and, you know, I have, so I was between being an inquirer and then become in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church and becoming um, Antiochian Orthodox was probably three or four years. And it's been three or four years since then. Wow. And I still have not heard anything um, in the Eastern Orthodox Church that conflicts with what I was taught mm-hmm. and catechized mm-hmm. um, in Ethiopia. I haven't heard one thing, God, one word. God God bless you. That's an amazing story. It really is. And uh, I think there's a, a kind of tinge of sadness, right? Because you obviously uh, found great solace and truth uh, when you were in e- Ethiopia, from Protestantism to the Ethiopian Orthodox mm-hmm. Church, uh, and then to come here. So it's like a really amazing, amazing story. We're just going to ask for very brief comments, uh, Dr. Humphrey and then Dr. Gurgis. So I, I'm not surprised that you don't find, didn't find any difference in teaching and in, and in worship, um, because generally we don't go around spending a lot of time talking about two wills or two natures. We we use liturgical mysterious language like the one who who became incarnate and was crucified without change, right? And and, and we, we keep those tensions together and, and, and the two communities have different communities have different ways of doing that. Um, so I'm I'm not surprised. Um, I think that one, we have to be careful though that we wouldn't make normative a person's individual experience. That I think that there are substantive things that we do need to talk about as as uh, as um, uh, followers of Christ. Um, but yeah. but what you say gives me great hope, Doctor Gurgis. Yes. So um, I mean, I, I always put a distinction as I. Uh, I alluded to in my interview between you know uh, experience or encounter and and expression and uh, um, ultimately you know noetically perhaps some people might perceive uh, the, the, the higher reality of Christ uh, standing there um, and, and and not be focused on on the categories that we then project on him uh, uh, you know in in our human incapacities. But uh, uh, n- n- you know, nonetheless, um, coming back to the to the realm of, of uh, expression, um, you know, the, the what you know, when I, I again I, I discussed that with Jean uh, during my uh, longer uh, interview. But you always say, you know, lex orandi, lex credendi, or lex credendi, lex orandi. Like what you pray is what you believe, and what you believe is what you pray, and. Um, definitely the, the liturgical language is perhaps the, the safest, uh, you know, conduit for, for the, the purest form of faith. And um, uh, that's perhaps something that we need to re-examine, uh, even when we talk about topics like uh, theosis. Indeed, indeed. I apologize, my camera is going crazy here. All right, thank you very much, Michael. We really appreciate that. Daniel, welcome to Ancient Faith Today. You're on the line with Dr. Edith Humphrey, Dr. Emmanuel Gurgis, and John Maddox. Uh, thank you all for having me. I, uh, it's a blessing to be able to speak with you. Um, I'm a Coptic uh, Christian. I was a seminarian at St. Vladimir's. I graduated a few years ago. I was blessed to be a student of uh, Father Chad and uh, Dr. Peter Butenev. So I want to say a couple of things. I think kind of this is a good segue, though the past uh, speaker was a good segue. The liturgical text of the church, um, specifically the Coptic church, is a great way <clears throat> to understanding what our belief actually is. I think focusing on one person's writing and not the entire corpus of what the church has handed down to us does us a disservice. 
being cops who have been under persecution and are still under persecution, we're just starting to gasp for breath. Um, as an American, I was born in America. My first time going to Egypt was a month ago, right? So our context here and being shocked when I went and their context there is completely different. We have so much of our tradition that's been hidden and um, <clears throat> that has not been brought to or re-brought to life for our own people to experience because of the difficult conditions that they live in. So a little bit of grace as we kind of, um, I want to say in a way, rediscover and, and at a high level. Right? So to be able to study our material at a high level is not something that we've done for a very long time. And that's just the truth of it. It is lived. So, and this is the important thing is that um, the liturgical praxis, we have seen the Lord manifested in his church in Egypt. And like we said, the experience is different, but that liturgical praxis is very clear to us that this is a way to say of this, right? because we've seen mm -hmm. our people sanctified by our Lord in his church. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, a little bit of grace, a little bit of time where um, we can all begin, the Oriental churches as a whole, the idea of liturgical studies, I mean, the Eastern Orthodox tradition has been studied and will continue to be studied at a very high level. We're coming to that mm -hmm. table, and it was a beautiful thing at St. Vladimir's to be offered a seat at that table. I, I, I chanted with the Eastern Orthodox I chanted with our, our brothers in the, in the Syriac and Malankar traditions, and we saw Orthodoxy in practice as one family, mm. and that was something that I will never forget. So um, the idea of the North America almost being the battleground, or for, uh, the playground rather, um, is going to really play into how we learn to dialogue with each other again, um, how we learn to not assume about each other, and focusing on the totality of the tradition as opposed to yeah. one person's writing is going to be super uh, important I, for us. Daniel, I, I really appreciate that. And I, I want to ask one very quick follow-up question, and that is, do you think, because we talked about all these dialogues mm -hmm. and we talked about you know these agreed statements and uh, we're talking about Mia and Mono and Physis and so forth, you know, there's, there, I, from the, Orthodox, uh, from the Eastern Orthodox standpoint, there is a little bit of angst because St. Vladimir sponsored, um, you know, having the Oriental Orthodox, and they've had the Armenians there forever. It's been a very long time. And St. Tikhon says the same thing. Do you feel, as a Coptic Orthodox, that this actually may help a, a mutual understanding of the two uh, church families? I don't know if I could possibly express more than I than I than I have how much I agree with that statement. Yes, a thousand percent. Being able to interact with our brothers and our sisters on campus and being a family, um, and interacting with each other's children and praying together daily, serving together, um, growing together, making mistakes, and being a part of that community had a profound impact on every single person. We suffered together. We we, uh, we 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 were joyous together. We celebrated feasts together. We it was a whole different thing. So it caused us to have to deal. It's almost like uh, theology of marriage, right? Being tied to somebody and committed to that person causes each person to lay aside for the other. And we need to be able, as as one church, um, are striving to become again and restoring that one body of Christ, to be able to understand each other and and lay down whatever parts of us that are hindering us from actually being able to come into actual dialogue right it's different from talking with someone than talking at somebody and i think we've done that for way too long um so the opening Perfect. of the doors for us as students to come to saint vladimir's uh, not only does it have a personal impact but it has an impact on the ability for us to continue this dialogue Excellent. Uh, Dr. Gurgis, please give us your thoughts. Yes, uh, actually being a, a professor at the Antiochian House of Studies myself, uh, we started the Oriental Orthodox uh, Studies track a few years back, and we've had uh, multiple students uh, also from the Oriental tradition. Um, and, you know, it's such a beautiful encounter that we have there with 
you know, um, doing uh, uh, some of the Coptic uh, rites of, of like midnight praises and having people join us, uh, you know, and, and attend and understand the language and, and, and get a flavor themselves. Um, and we, you know, attend uh, Eastern Orthodox services as well. So I think this is a, a very fertile uh, ground for, for that kind of encounter that we're talking about because for the first time, you know, we're standing next to each other and looking at Christ, I may they say, noetically rather than um, as a corpse under a microscope uh, trying to dissect and, and, and ask the questions what and how. I think we are finding a space where we are uh, looking uh, at him uh, in, in, in his eyes and asking who and why. Dr. Humphrey. So I would just say that I, uh, for, for me, um, my appreciation of the Oriental community uh, grew not only by meeting and teaching and talking with Oriental uh, Orthodox whose who's, um, love of Jesus is just very evident. And they are, as Dr. Ford says, they shine. It's, it's very clear. But also, I really enjoyed reading Dr. Daniel Fannis's, um, uh biography of uh, Patriarch uh, Kirillos VI and the wonderful things that he did for, 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 um, for the church and uh, the bringing in of the Sunday school movement and, and that kind of revival that took place. And I, I think if we come to know each other's um, present history, too, that that will help. Excellent. Um, before we ask John for a few final thoughts, again, I want to offer my thanks to Dr. Emmanuel uh, Gurgis for joining us uh, impromptu. It was very wonderful. Dr. Humphrey, thank you very much for your um, uh, cogent responses. Um, we want to remind you, by the way, this documentary will be posted on YouTube and Facebook and uh, at ancientfaith.com, as well as the show, as well as all of the entire um, interviews that John did. So it's all going to be out there. Obviously, this was edited. We still were at two and a half hours right now. John, give us your last thoughts. Yeah, I can't emphasize enough how enriched you will be if you take the time to watch these interviews in their entirety. Uh, they were so enlightening, and I just came to genuinely love each participant. And Daniel, God bless you. Um, I, I cannot tell you what an encouragement your call was, and to just envision your family uh, with the families of other seminarians at uh, St. Vladimir's is, is such a source of encouragement. So I would conclude with this. Certainly our Lord would have us be one, but not at any cost, not at the expense of his identity as taught and defended by the church for many centuries. So where do we start if we are serious about that? I remember someone telling me when we were first investigating orthodoxy that orthodox theological framework is on one side of a coin and Roman Catholic and Protestant framework is on the other side. I didn't understand that at the time, but I do now. And so as we think about the best prospects for fulfilling Christ's desire that we be one, and you mentioned this at the very beginning, Father Tom, the low-hanging fruit is to continue the dialogue and the exploration with our Oriental Orthodox uh, friends and to learn more about each other, get to know them personally, and uh, find out more about the richness of, of their tradition and how it could possibly uh, mesh with our own. Excellent. John, we can't thank you enough. Simon, thank you. Yeoman's work you guys did on this really tremendous. Thank you to everybody who's uh, working the phones, to Trudy, to Melinda. Thank you very, very much to all the people that participated in the chat rooms. We really appreciate you very, very much. Thanks for all the uh, messages that we received. I promise we're going to respond to everything. 
And again, thank you to Dr. Emmanuel Gurgis and Dr. Edith Humphrey for joining us tonight. That's our show for tonight. Remember to like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash ancient faith today. Share out our program after that's posted. Give us your feedback. Contact us with any ideas or topics that you might want to hear about and join us next Tuesday evening. Yeah, we actually will have a show next Tuesday evening for another edition of Ancient Faith Today. Good night, everybody.